Installing the operating system on a Raspberry Pi is so easy because all you need to do is flash an image to a micro SD card. But did you know there are actually some advanced options you can take advantage of, which avoids the need to connect your Pi to a keyboard, mouse or monitor, even if the Pi is only going to have access to Wi-Fi. So whether you're new to the Raspberry Pi or you want to find out about these advanced features, stick around and watch this video because that's what we'll be going over. Now to install the official Raspberry Pi OS, we want to use the Raspberry Pi Imager. And you can get that if you point your web browser to this URL here. I'll leave a link for this in the description. And then there are various different operating systems that they've got support for. In my case, I actually want the one for Windows. So I'm going to click on Download for Windows. It's going to download that executable file. And the installation is actually so simple, I'm not even going to bother covering it. There's, there's no questions to be asked. It's just a few clicks and that's about it. But once you've got the software installed, the next thing to do is to flash your actual SD card. Now I'm going to make an assumption that your computer can write to a micro SD card. If not, then you'll need to purchase a hub for it. Now you may also need an adapter to be able to write to micro SD cards, although typically you do actually get one when you actually purchase the micro SD card itself. In any case, once you've got the Raspberry Pi Imager software up and running, what you want to do first is pick the operating system to actually flash to the SD card. So we'll click Choose OS. I don't want the option right at the top because uh, that's a 32-bit version. I'm going to select Raspberry Pi OS Other. And then it really comes down to these two options because your typical Raspberry Pi these days is a 64-bit processor. So if you want the desktop option, go with that. If you want the light version, in the words no desktop, go with that option. Now in my case, I don't need the desktop, so I'm just going to click that. Next thing to do is to choose the storage. In other words, the actual micro SD card we're going to actually write this to. So we'll click choose storage. And then I'll actually select that uh, disk that we've got there. Now, one thing I'll point out is that it's now giving us the option to write to that SD card, but it's also given us this option down here, which is this cog. Now that's a fairly recent addition, I would say, because the older versions didn't give you this direct access or easy access to the advanced options, as we'll see. Um, before, what you had to do is hold down the control key, the shift key, and then hit X to be able to get access to the advanced options. Now, as soon as you pick the operating system, this cog shows up, and if you click that, it gives you access to advanced options. Now. One thing I'll point out is that you typically probably wouldn't actually want to select this option, which is to always use because it'll start storing information like your usernames and passwords, uh, your SSID for your wireless settings, along with the password that goes with that. So usually you probably wouldn't want to do that. You'd be better off using this for this session only because as you can see, it's remembering previous settings. So yeah, from a security perspective, it's better to go with that option. Anyway, there's quite a few things we can choose from here. So for instance, we can set the host name. So rather than having the default, which is Raspberry Pi, I'm going to change this and I'm just going to call it Fred's Pi. And what you also want to do is I want to be able to get remote access to this straight away. I don't want to have to plug in a, a keyboard, a mouse and a monitor. As soon as this is up and running, I just want to get remote access to it. So I'm going to select that option, enable SSH. Now, by default, it's set up to use a username and password to get access, although there is an option here to put in a public key if you want. The only thing to bear in mind is, although it's giving you that public key option, you're going to be stuck with a Pi user account, and it's really better to go with a different account than the normal Pi one, because then it's harder for somebody to get access to your Pi. This is the default commonly known uh, username, and it's always recommended to change user accounts to something different. Don't use the built-in ones or the, the default ones. So in this case, I'm just going to call this one Fred because this is, this is going to get used by Fred. Then we need to put in a long and complex password as usual. Um, I'm just going to keep it relatively simple for me for the sake of the video. If this is a, a Raspberry Pi that you're going to hook up to your Wi-Fi, then you can put the details in there. So you can put in your SSID, you can put in your password there, and then you would change the wireless LAN country as well by clicking on the drop-down menu here. 
And then what we've got underneath is you can set the local settings as well. So you change your time zone and your keyboard layout here if necessary. One other thing I would suggest to point out is at the bottom, you've got enable telemetry. Now, if you don't want um, statistics information about what this Pi is up to, for example, that's something you might be wanting to disable. The rest of the settings, pretty important because these allow you to then get direct access to that Raspberry Pi, as I say, without having to plug anything into it. You can just power it up and if it's got access to Wi-Fi, then it will just connect using the SSID and the, the password you've given it and you'll be able to connect in using that username and password we've supplied there. So what I need to do now is click on save and then I'll click on write and it's warning me that it's going to raise that card, which is fine. That's exactly what I want it to do. So I'm going to click yes. And then off it's going to do, uh, go and it's actually going to write to the card. Once it's finished actually writing to the card, it'll also verify it and then it'll be finished. But this is going to take a bit of a while. So once it's finished, I'll bring you back. Well, as you can see, the process is now finished and it's written the image to the SD card. And so as it suggests here, you can just basically click on continue and remove your SD card from your computer. And then it's a matter of plugging that micro SD card into your Raspberry Pi and then just turning it on. Now I would suggest leaving it for a few minutes because it does take quite a bit of while, especially for the first time it's going to boot up. Uh, it's going to go through a process and I've noticed it does at least reboot once. If you were to plug an actual monitor in, uh, what you'll find is that there are times where it looks as though the actual process might have just stopped and it's just not working anymore, but it does actually work fine. So like I suggest is just leave it for a few minutes and then just try and SSH into it. Now, assuming your Raspberry Pi is now up and running, we'll want to get access to it remotely using SSH. The only catch is we don't necessarily know what the IP address is. Now, you could just go and have a look at your router, for example, or your DHCP server, if that's a separate computer altogether that hands out dynamic IP addressing. But there is another way that we can actually get direct access using SSH if your computer is in the same network as your Raspberry Pi, and that is to use the local domain name. So in my case, I've got Putty open on this computer and it's in the same network that my Raspberry Pi is just being put into. So I'm actually going to put in Fred's Pi dot local, but I have to tell it the user account. So I'm going to log in as Fred to fredspi.local. So .local is the domain. We're going to connect on port 22, in other words, SSH. So I'm going to click open. Now this is the first time I've connected it uh, to the actual Raspberry Pi. So I need to accept the, uh, the fingerprint here. So I'll click yes. And now it's asking for a password. So I'm going to type in my password. And there you go, I've got remote access into my Raspberry Pi. Now, this particular one, I must admit, it's actually connected into the LAN, but it makes no difference whether I'm plugging in through an RJ45 cable or through the Wi-Fi. I've still got remote access to it either way. Uh, it's been able to get its IP address through the DHCP server. So, like I say, I mean, I could have gone to the DHCP server or router to get that IP address, but that's a, a neat way that you can just get direct access to the actual computer. Um, if you don't know what the IP is, but once you're logged in, you do want to find out what that is. So if you type in IP space ADDR, for example, hit return, and it's coming back down here, and it's actually giving me the IP address. Uh, it tells me the DHCP details and so on that I'm interested in. So that's that's really useful to uh, to know for you know further down the line, um, especially if this is going to be a computer that needs access to things through a firewall, for instance. We want to know what this IP address is, so. I mean, there are options where we could statically set this IP address within the Raspberry Pi, or what I find is easier, to be honest, is just set it up as a, like a, um, a sort of like a reserved IP address within your DHCP server. For that, you need to know what the MAC address is. So we've got that information over there for this particular interface. So there's the IP address that's been handed out through DHCP, but that's its MAC address. So if we now go to our DHCP server or router, we can actually reserve a a specific IP address just for this computer. Next time it boots up, it'll actually get a different IP address and it'll always get that IP address. And then we can use that in firewall rules, for example. But now that we've actually got this up and running, one of the first things I do want to do 
is actually just update the actual computer. So sudo apt update. And off it will go and talk to the internet and update its repository and list of packages and so on. And then what we'll do is we'll actually upgrade the operating system as well. Now, one thing I'll point out though is that you do want to make this computer more secure, uh, even in the home. Uh, I would suggest installing UFW, for instance. Uh, I've got a video on how you actually set up UFW within a Linux environment, and that's what this is. It's, it's a Debian operating system. It just doesn't actually have UFW installed by default. So if I do sudo UFW uh, status, for example, it's saying that it's not found, so we, we would have to actually install that. Uh, but once you've actually got it installed, you can actually configure it and start setting up rules to make this more secure. I would also suggest actually setting this up uh, so that it only allows access through SSH keys. And I've got a separate video on how to actually set up SSH keys, whether it's through Linux or uh, a Windows computer like this. In this particular case, though, we've got that update done. So I'm going to do a sudo upgrade because I want to actually upgrade the computer. Uh, sudo apt upgrade, I should say. So I do want to actually upgrade the operating system. But I mean, as you can see, it's, it's very easy to do it. I mean... You just download the actual imaging software, pick your operating system, and then just set your configurations. And what I really like about that is the fact that this could actually be a remote computer. I could literally send this uh, micro SD card to a, you know another Raspberry Pi somewhere out in the field, for example, for somebody else and just plug in, it'll boot up. And as long as it's got access to the DHCP server, it'll get an IP address and I'll be able to get more access to it. So this, this makes life a whole lot easier, especially if you've got a Raspberry Pi that only works on Wi-Fi, because with something like that, if you don't have access through the actual console, it's going to be very difficult to make configuration changes. But like I say, there are other things I would suggest setting up your SSH keys, setting up UFW and so on. But at this stage, we've got a Raspberry Pi up and running and get remote access to it. So that's great. Well, thanks for making it to the end of this video. I really do hope you found it useful. If so, then do click the like button and share as that'll help get the video out to more people who might find it useful as well. If you've got any comments or suggestions, please post those in the comments section below. And if you're new to the channel and you'd like to see more content like this, then yes, do subscribe. Just remember to set the bell icon to actually send you notifications when new content gets released. Although I also post to Twitter as well as Facebook. If you'd like to help the channel and support it, you can actually make contributions through PayPal and buy me a coffee. I've also got links to Patreon and there's also the join membership option for YouTube itself. Patreon and YouTube members do have the option to actually benefit from early access as well. But above all, many thanks for watching this video. I'll see you in the next one.